Uh, so, we are in a series now. Uh, this is week three of me looking at some questions that Jesus asks in the New Testament. And as I made mention of last week, if you've read your New Testament, you know in the New Testament, Jesus, just in the four Gospels, asks over a hundred different questions. So I I get a number of them to select and choose from. And today we're going to be looking, uh, if you have your Bibles, at Matthew 9. There are Bibles in some of the uh, chairs in front of you. There's Bibles, if you don't own a Bible, at the Welcome Center. Feel free to take one of those and keep it and take it home. Or if you know somebody who just needs a Bible, take it with you and give it to them. That's a gift from us to you or to them. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you but you've got an iPhone or Android, version is a great app. And today what I want to do is to talk to you specifically those who maybe you, like you feel like you really need a response from God in your life right now. Maybe you have a a problem or a challenge or or something in life that you just don't know how to solve on your own. Uh, And maybe you've been praying about it, right? And you've been believing that God is going to respond. And maybe you're praying for a miracle even. But so far, it hasn't happened. And if you need a miracle, I I believe with, with all of my heart that this week's message will speak to you, hopefully. Because we're going to be looking at two blind guys. And Jesus asked these two blind guys this question. Do you believe that I am able to do this? So we're going to look at Matthew 9. As I said, it's going to be Matthew 9, uh, 27 through 30 is where we're going to hang out for the day. And I want to give you the context, a little background here, uh, just before we get going. And then after we do that, we'll dive right in. But right before this part of the story, Jesus, you see, had just healed a little girl. In fact, not only healed, but he had raised her from the dead. And blown everybody's minds, right? As you can imagine. I mean, little girl's in there dead. Jesus walks in. Jesus and little girl walks out, right? Whoa, that would be amazing. And so rumors are beginning to spread about Jesus and all these things that he's doing. And, 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 and that's kind of the stage where we are at in Jesus' ministry. And so evidently, uh, these two blind guys who needed or wanted a miracle in their lives had heard about these things that have been going on. And that's where we pick up the story today in Matthew 9, 27 through 30. Here's how the story goes, if you want to follow along. As Jesus passed on from there, the two blind men following followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And you see, pausing right there, that when they called Jesus the son of David, that indicates that they believed that he was the Messiah. This is a thought Very early on, in fact, in Jesus' ministry, this thought that Jesus was the Messiah is something that would have absolutely driven the Pharisees mad. They just, they they would have been infuriated by hearing these words from these two guys. And when these guys call out and they cry out, uh, the Greek meaning of the word to cry out, the Greek word is kratzo, um, it's the very same word there as, as they cry out to Jesus. It's the very same word there that's used to describe a woman yelling during childbirth. It's intense, right? I mean, there's nothing quite like having your wife trying to break your hand while screaming in your face, You did this to me! Right? Can I get an amen? <laughs> Some of you have been there, right? You know what I'm talking about. But it's, it's, it's this intense cry as these guys cry out. And that's what these blind guys do because... They've heard that Jesus is healing people, right? And they're thinking, maybe, maybe, maybe he could do it for us. Now, obviously, I, I, I've never been blind. Um, and, and it would be, it, it's, I, I can't even really truly imagine what it would be like not to be able to see. The closest experience I've ever had to being blind was, um, I was working on my car, and I was sitting, and uh, I was cleaning some parts with carburetor cleaner, and so I had a little uh, paper towel in my hand, and I'd reach up, and I'd spray a little paper towel with the, the carburetor cleaner, and then I'd clean a little part, and then move, and spray a little bit more, and you know, so I'd been doing this for a while, and you know, it kind of became just kind of automatic, and I finally reached up and, and hit the spray to put some more on my paper towel so I could keep working, and I hadn't noticed that the spray nozzle head had turned. And so I reached up and went, and it came directly 
between my eyes, right above my eyes, right like smack dab in the middle of my forehead. And, and I, you know, obviously wasn't expecting this. It just blasts me in the face. Thankfully, it didn't go directly into one of my eyes, but it blasts me in the face when that, you know, if you ever use those sprays, they spray pretty hard. So it splatters everywhere. I get both eyes dosed and there's fuming coming off of these powerful carburetor cleaner and um, I'm, I'm in shock and all of a sudden instant white hot pain in my eyeballs and you can't almost breathe because the fumes are overwhelming you and um, I'm just you know <sighs> that moment of panic hits right and I know I know I had a bottle that I'd been drinking out of I had a water bottle nearby so so I stand up and I'm feeling around and I got my eyes closed because I don't want any more to get in my eyes and finally I feel this bottle and I spin off the lid and dose my face and um, just like I, I can't see and when I spray that on my face what happens is that causes the carburetor cleaner that was on my face now to run into my eyes so now it's really burning um, I'm, I'm really in pain and so I'm fumbling around trying to find it I know there's more water bottles here and I finally get another one and in the process you know I'm knocking everything over and I I get that second bottle into my eyes and just dose my eyes. And when I'm done, I'm standing there just dripping head to feet with water, bloodshot red eyes, tools and stuff strewn everywhere like a small localized tornado had gone through my garage. But the good news was I was no worse for the wear. I didn't hurt the car or any of the tools or equipment I was working on. So uh, that is the good news. But yikes! Incredibly painful, super frightening. Losing eyesight is, wow, that's fear. And so in the story, we have these two guys who have never seen, and, and, and they're, they're calling out, help me, Jesus, right? They're calling out to Jesus from the very, very depths of their soul, and they're believing that maybe he could do something for them. And then we see here that they're following him, that they're, that they're desperate. And they've probably most likely been blind all of their lives. We don't know absolutely, but they've been blind at least for a while. And that brings us to verse 38, or 28, sorry. Verse 28. It says, When Jesus had entered the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. Notice it doesn't say according to their income. It's not according to their social standing. It wasn't according to what other people thought of them. It wasn't according to whether or not they went to church or the temple that last weekend. It wasn't according to the clothes that they wore. It wasn't according to any of those kinds of things. It was according to their faith. Which is I think really encouraging. It's a, a faith-building part of the story, frankly, to know that God responds to faith. In fact, Scripture teaches us that. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. God loves our faith. God loves when we believe in faith. And this is a faith-building story. Because suddenly we realize if we have faith, faith that we can move the heart of God. So we know that faith moves the heart of God. But what kind of faith? What kind of faith does God honor? And what I want to do is look at three different types of faith that God honors. And it's my prayer that this story will build your faith today. If you're taking notes, number one in your bulletin there. Number one, if you're taking notes, is what kind of faith does God honor? God honors a faith that believes when it doesn't see. God honors a faith that believes even when it doesn't see. Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is the confidence that what we have hoped for will actually happen. It gives us assurances of things we cannot see. In fact, this is exactly what happens in Matthew 9.28. Let me read it for you again. It says, when he, Jesus, entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord, we believe. And I would ask you the very same question today. If you take 
whatever massive challenge that you're facing, a, a relational challenge, a, a physical challenge, a financial challenge, maybe it's a spiritual challenge, do you believe that God is able to hear your prayer and answer on your behalf? Do you believe that all things are possible with God? Do you believe that He is able? Now, of course, the, the churchy answer, if you've been in the church world for any length of time, is, oh, yeah, 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 I believe, right? I praise the Lord, hallelujah, I believe He can. Right? That's the old Sunday school answer, because that's what we're trained to say, right? But so often, our actions and our words betray us. Our actions and our words show the truth of what we really believe. Because our actions often indicate, frankly, that we don't believe. And the words that we use sometimes give away. That we're not sure God can do this. Think about it. Ask yourself. In the last week, what have you been praying faithfully for? Every single day. Some of us. Not much, right? What you pray about reflects what you believe about God. Think about it. When you pray, what you pray about, it reflects what you believe about the Almighty God. If you don't pray much, it shows that you really don't believe that God is active and going to respond to your prayers. You don't really believe that God is involved. You don't really believe that God can. If you don't pray much, that really shows how much you believe in God and what you believe about God. If you're praying for some really big things, that indicates that you believe in a big and powerful God. I would say it this way. The size of your request reveals the strength of your faith. I'm going to say that again because it's pretty good. The size of your request reveals the strength of your faith. If all you do is ask God for little things, right? Little things that are probably going to happen anyhow, right? You know, it's okay to pray, God, give us a safe trip. That's a good thing. I mean, I'm not telling you not to pray for those sorts of things. Do. But if that's all you're praying for, right? God, give us a safe trip to the grocery store. Well, I live two blocks from the grocery store. I do want to be safe, but odds are it's going to go okay, right? What we pray for and how we pray shows what we believe about God. The size of of your request reveals the strength of your faith. Jesus says, do you believe that I am able? Now, I don't know what all of your stories would be. I don't know what it is that you've been praying for necessarily. But do you believe that God is able to heal a marriage that's kind of gone off the rails? Do you believe that God can help you overcome an addiction that's plagued you for years and years and years? Do you believe that the name of Jesus is bigger than cancer and He can overcome and can heal? Do you believe that with God all things are possible? Because a faith that honors God is a faith that believes, even though it doesn't see. Jesus asked the question, do you believe that I am able to do this? So what kind of faith honors God? A faith that believes even when it doesn't see. The second kind of faith that honors God, if you're taking notes there, is this. It's a faith that persists when nothing changes. A faith that persists when nothing changes. A faith that continues to believe. Think about this. The guys cry out, Jesus, have mercy on us, son of David. Right? 
And then what does Jesus do? If you are paying attention to the story, what does Jesus do? They're, they're going, Jesus! And, and they're screaming at him, right? Jesus, have mercy on us. What does Jesus do? He keeps on walking. He goes into the house. He goes into a building, right? He doesn't stop and talk to him. He walks past him and keeps on moving. And so what do these guys do? They follow him. I mean, you, you can almost sense there's this, we're going to uh, follow him until he either heals us or he kicks us out, right? We are going to keep believing and persisting. We are going to keep following him no matter what. That's what these blind guys are doing. Persist and persevere. In fact, I love the way Colossians 4.2 says it. And they say, it says this about prayer. It says we are to be persistent. It says be persistent in prayer, keeping alert as you pray, giving thanks to God. What are you doing? You're giving thanks to God for something that hasn't even happened yet. What does that take? It takes faith. Persistent in prayer, continuing to pray even when things do not change. There was a, a lady in my last church who told me this story. And she had been married for many, many years. And they'd had a bunch of kids. And her husband just never had any interest in going to church. In fact, he was anti-church. He'd had a bad experience as a Catholic and swore off the church was turned off by church and faith. And it took a toll on their relationship. But she prayed for him. After a few years of prayer, you see, she almost quit praying for him. And there was a lengthy time where she too even quit going to church. But she never quit praying, she said. Two years of praying. Five years of praying. Ten years of praying. And then almost... 25 years that she had been praying for him. She said there had been so many times where she was so tempted to quit praying, to give up. She didn't see any movement from him, any improvement from him. She wondered if all of her efforts, if all of her prayers were useless. There were no results. But then one day, out of the blue, that changed. Out of the blue, one day her husband said that I might be interested in visiting a church sometime. And, and he said, in fact, I'd like to kind of go see and visit a church that's going through this movie thing called Fireproof. Well, it just so happens that my church was across the street from the school she worked in, and I had begun a sermon series on the movie Fireproof. She called, and I said, well, yeah, uh, come on over. And wouldn't you know, amazing thing has happened. And just a couple of short years later, I got to baptize him and some of his kids. Praise the Lord. I don't know who's here today, who that's going to minister to, but I know there's somebody who's been praying for something for an awfully long time. And there's that, that little voice in the back of our heads, right, that just goes, why are you still praying about this? Why do you still believe this? God could never do that, right? It's not going to happen. I'm here to tell you that a faith that honors God is a faith that persists even when things do not change. Even though you do not see it yet. You continue believing. That's the kind of faith that honors God. Don't. Don't give up. So what kind of faith moves the heart of God? A kind of faith that believes even when it does not see. A kind of faith that persists even when nothing changes. And then number three, if you're taking notes, a faith that works even when it doesn't make sense. A faith that is moved, a faith that is marked by actions, even though everyone else in the world thinks you're crazy. You see, there's a big difference between hope and faith. Hope is a desire. Faith is a demonstration. Hope is just an inward desire. Faith is a demonstration that moves, that acts, that works with faith. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, he powerfully describes how Abraham's faith uh, 
was lived out and, and was marked by his actions. If you don't know the story, it's one of the most faith-filled stories in all of the Bible. When God moves upon the heart of Abraham and, and he says to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. I mean, as you're reading this, if you're the first time you were ever reading through the Bible and you're reading the story of Abraham and he's going to sacrifice his son Isaac, you're going, this is crazy, right? This is completely insane. I mean... I can't imagine. I'm a father. I have an eight-year-old son. I can't imagine God asking me to take my son to the altar and sacrifice him. I just, uh, I, I can't fathom it, right? And so what does Abraham do? He goes and he gathers wood, right? And he gets a rope to tie up his son's hand. He gets the materials to, to start this fire. And he walks up the mountain with his son. And he and goes and gets ready, to pre- gets prepared to take the life of his son out of obedience to God. And... and, and And we get to that part of the story, right? And God would never actually ask someone to do this. And he stops it. And he says, Abraham, you've passed the test. Abraham, you've shown your faith. Abraham, I'm providing a sacrifice. Over in the bushes, there's a ram. Go get it. Go sacrifice that ram. You've been obedient, and I can bless you. And here's how James describes the faith and actions of Abraham. This is so powerful. James 2.22, he says, You see, Abraham's faith and actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what? Not just by what he thought, by not just what he prayed. How was his faith made complete? James tells us his faith was made complete by what he did. His faith and his actions were working together. His faith was made complete by what he did. What kind of faith honors God? It's a faith that works, even when it doesn't necessarily make sense. I mean, think about this. These, these two blind guys, right? These blind guys could have been like any one of us. You have a problem, and, and if you're like me, you magnify that problem, right? All you can think about is that problem. You're so focused on that problem that you lose sight of any solution in the hands of God. And these guys are going, we, we're blind. and We've probably been blind all of our lives, right? And, 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 I, and I can imagine these guys, right? They, they, this is before the time where they had uh, the canes. You know, you, you, you ever seen a blind person walking around with a cane and they can feel the world around them and find their direction. They didn't, they didn't have those canes. They didn't have seeing eye dogs back in those days to help them get from place to place and live their lives. I mean, these, these guys are, are full on blind and, and, and they're the kind of people in that culture and society that couldn't find work. They had to sit somewhere like in front of the temple, out on the side of the street, begging for people's mercy. Just, can you give me some money? I'm blind. I can't work. I can't see, right? I, I, I can't have kids. I'm probably never going to get married. I, I, I can't have any meaning in my life. I'm blind. I, just help me out here with a little bit of something, right? And in that culture, they would have lived under tremendous shame because in that culture, if you were blind, it was believed that you had done something. You had sinned or your parents had sinned. One of the two. Somebody, one of you guys, you did something wrong. And so you lived with shame if you were blind. You lived with embarrassment. And they probably lived with very, very little hope. We're blind. We can't do anything. Now, they could have just given up and and just thrown themselves a pity party and quit, right? But they didn't. They cry out to Jesus. They pursue Jesus. They believe that he can heal them. And they're going to do whatever they can to get in front of him. They're putting the work in. And when you mix your work with your faith, that can be made complete by God. You may be one of these people, you continue to go to the the wrong websites and look at the things that you shouldn't be looking at. What can you do, right? You can pray for the power of Jesus to deliver you, but then... Go a little step further and put a, put a block on your computer or your phone or a filter or, or some sort of app or, or just get rid of the electronics if that's what it takes, right? And you can work and believe together. You may not be able to change your spouse, but what can you do? You can continue with the help of God to love your spouse as Christ loved the church. And pray for your spouse. And your prayer may or may not change them, but your prayer always changes you. And you can let God begin to do a work in you. And your faith and works can come together. 
You may hate the fact that people are abused, right? And human trafficking. And you can't fix that throughout the world, right? Or you, you may just lament that you can't rescue every unborn child to make sure that they are born safely and given a chance for life. You can't help every child in the world to get an education. But suddenly, you realize, yeah, I can't do everything, but I can do something. So I'm going to pray big, and I'm going to start small. I'm going to pray big, and I'm going to start small. And I'm going to let my faith and my works come together, because that's the kind of faith that honors God. And so you... You may look on and you may say, okay, so I just have to have faith and I just have to try really hard and then God has to answer, right? Well, that's not exactly how it works, unfortunately. Listen to me. Our faith, our faith is not in us. If it is, we're sunk. Our faith is in the faithfulness of God. And when our faith is in the faithful, faithfulness of God, when we are able to trust him, Trust him with things, we were just talking about this the other day, like a faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? You know that story? When we can trust God with that kind of faith, you want to talk about massive faith? What a story. I'm looking forward to VBS. When you take three Hebrew teenagers, stand them in front of King Nebuchadnezzar, and the king says, bow down and worship my God. Don't worship your God. And if you don't, I'm going to throw you into a furnace. What do these teenage boys do? What do they say? I mean, we're talking junior high to maybe high school at the oldest. What do they say to him? He's the king. They are in captivity. He can do anything he wants to them. What do they say? No. No. We're not going to do that. We're not going to worship your God. No. You can throw us in the fire. Go ahead. Our God's going to rescue us. And even if he doesn't, we still will not worship your God. You see, that's the kind of faith that I want to have. It's the kind of faith that says this. Do you believe that I am able to do this, Jesus says. And my response is, with every fiber of my being, with every part of who I am, I believe that you can, God. And I believe that you will, God. And even if you don't, I still believe. I still believe. Because my faith is not in my faith. My faith is not in my works. My faith is not even in my desired outcome, you see. My faith is in the faithfulness of God. A God whose ways are, are higher, infinitely higher than my ways. A God whose thoughts I cannot comprehend. A God who is good through and through, all-powerful, ever-present, and all-knowing. My faith is in that God. Well, here's the bottom line. You can say, well, okay, Chris, good for you, preacher boy. You just go ahead with your blind faith. Simple, blind faith, right? You just have your blind faith. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because I would rather be blind with faith that God can heal than to have sight and have no faith. I would rather be blind with a faith that God can heal than to be able to see and have no faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what kind of faith honors God? A faith that believes, even though it doesn't see. A faith that persists, even though nothing changes. And a faith that works, even when it doesn't make sense. Because that's how good our God is. Do you believe that he is able to do this? With everything in us, yes. We believe that he can. We believe that he will. And even if he doesn't, you see, we will still believe. Amen? Let's pray.